Hello, it's Keith here, and this is episode 6 of the Grime 6502 series. So, you can see here we've got the Apple II version and the Atari 5200 version here, and hopefully you can notice that the sprites have now improved. I've improved the tile map, and I've actually done some quite nice colour versions, if I do say so myself, for the Apple II, because if you remember, the Apple II's colours are based on the combinations of pixels and this kind of colour distortion of the CRT screens, which is emulated with this emulator. And if I just start the game, you'll see I'm actually using a wide variety of colours. So basically, there are two possible palettes. One has black, white, blue and orange, and the other has green and purple, I think it is. So it's a quite a tricky palette to use, but I've managed to get a reasonably decent set of sprites and colours here. I've had to be a bit more simplistic, there's less detail, but the colours look really good. Now, the speed is still quite slow, but I think the main reason for that is actually the sound, because whenever it makes a sound, it's like the beeper speaker of the Spectrum. It uses all the CPU power. So I've had to make the, the blips quite short now, but, I mean, it, it's still usable. The um, it, It's an odd system, because it, it's got a 6.5 CO2 processor, so what it's, it's one of the better processors, but the graphics and the sound are still very limited. Now, the later versions of the Apple II do have better graphics alternatives, but I wanted to use the original one just to see what that was like. But anyway, you can see here that the game is reasonably playable. It looks pretty good considering the limitations of the graphics hardware. And so let's move on. So the Atari 5200 and C64 graphics, the half-width four-color graphics, they've been redrawn as well. I need to change my controls here. Some, some of these emulators are using a joypad and some are using keyboards, so I often use the wrong controls. But you can see this looks pretty good now. I've got nice colours here. And of course the game is very playable. Now as well as the graphics, I've also been doing some work on the speed. I've been optimising everything I can, as I've said before. But of course, yesterday my big project was the Super Nintendo and the Nintendo NES. Now if you remember, the Super Nintendo was having graphical glitches because I was writing directly to the VDP memory and um, sometimes the interrupts were handling, the non-maskable interrupts were firing during that write and that was causing problems. So I'm now caching the entire data like I was before with the NES into a buffer and then I'm using a DMA which directly copies banks of memory without the process's intervention so it's extremely fast. So during that non-maskable interrupt I'm firing up the DMA procedure of the Super Nintendo and that's copying the memory for me. So I can copy the entire memory every single frame and it's now very very fast. I've had to increase the slowdown on this version of the game and I don't think there's any more graphical glitches anymore so hopefully that's very good. Now I did come across another graphical glitch which was not related to the graphical processing yesterday. It was actually the, um, the, ca the mathematics for the increasing of the score was causing some corruption to the uh, the X and Y coordinates and it was actually causing sprites to appear in the wrong places on the screen, totally at random. So that was another graphical bug that I fixed, but it was actually a bug with the calculation routines, not the graphics routines themselves. So anyway, you can see the SNES version now I think is perfect. Now the NES version. Now it's the NES version and I'll tell you a little bit about the routine I'm using in a moment but you can now see the game is extremely fast, very, very fast indeed. It's actually possibly too fast, but it, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult because how fast should the game be? Um, I mean, I quite like it at this speed. It, it feels like quite um, quite panicked, if you will. You know, the game's sort of spreading and it, you, you, you feel the urgency of it. So I quite, I think it quite works at fast speed, but maybe it's too fast, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, the point is the, the graphics routines now are looking really good. You've not got that slow frame rate problem anymore and the game's perfectly playable. So there we go. At this stage the game is completely playable on all the systems but I think the one, the other one we want to look at is the Atari Lynx. I threatened that I was going to convert it to 8x6 tiles rather than 8x8 tiles and I have done that. Let's have a look at it. So you can see now the tiles are slightly shorter. It doesn't look too much different. Now if you notice there's some slight corruption on the text it, it kind of looks a bit um, like it's not so clear but I'll explain what I've done in just a moment as soon as I read what the controls are as soon as I don't die as soon as the game starts as well. So if you look at the circles that are um, just sort of surrounding those kind of um, descending planetoid things then um, you'll notice that there's essentially a line missing from the top half and bottom half of the sprite. So I've actually skipped two lines of the sprites. What I mean, and this is true of the text as well, 
is rather than redraw the sprites and the text, I'm actually just skipping two of the lines. Now, the disadvantage of that is it makes the graphics a bit glitchy. You know, they don't look as nice as they could otherwise. But the advantage of that is it's meant no redrawing work for me. And it also means that if I find the links thing here and I disable short tile here and recompile, you can now see we can play it at full screen. So because I've not redrawn the sprites, we can have two versions of the game if we so want. I'm not sure we do, but we can. So there we go. So that's the Lynx version. Um, I'll show all of the versions on the last day, but I don't think any of the others have actually changed, really. Oh, BBC still needs its graphics fixing. I didn't, I'd forgotten about that. So, OK, that needs to go on my to-do list. Fix BBC graphics. There we go. I mean, I've just sort of given a blatant spoiler for what I'm going to do tomorrow. So the first thing I want to do is I want to try out Vic20's multicolor mode. Vic20 has a four-color half-resolution mode. It's not as advanced as the C64 in that three of the colors are fixed on the entire screen and only one color is configurable. But I think it's at least worth having a look at. I'm going to try and make a better randomizer, maybe. Need to fix the web address on the VIC-20 screen, still not got around to it. I've just noticed the BBC graphics aren't so good. And then the other thing I'm going to be doing is code commenting. The code's still quite messy, so I'm going to be doing any optimization I can, commenting the code, um, and that will give us a finished product at the end of the seven days. So still a little bit more work to do, but everything is coming on nicely. And the important thing at this stage is I'm not aware of any bugs in the game. I think the game is actually reliable, so that's very good. So let's have a look at the new NES VDP function. So here is the new non-maskable interrupt handler here. And we are still using VDP buffer, but we're doing it in a much more simple way now. So what we've got here is a counter. This will start at zero. And this is how many commands are in the queue at VDP buffer. So we can only process a limited number of commands within one VDP vBlank because the vBlank isn't long enough to do more than that. So I'm processing 32 commands and each command is three bytes. It's a very simple format. All it is is the memory address, two bytes for the memory address we're writing to and the byte we want to write to that memory address. Now, if we get more than 32 commands, we force a vBlank. We wait until the vBlank occurs so that the buffer doesn't get too full. Because if it got too full, it wouldn't be able to write at all during the vBlank and the screen would start shaking again. So that's not what we want. So all we do here is we set y to 0, see if y is now greater than the count of the commands. If it is, then we jump to done, where we reset the scroll position. But if it's not, then what we do is we process the queue here. We load in the first byte, and we save that to the h byte of the memory address, the high byte. Then we load in the second and save it to the low byte. And then we load in the byte and we set it to set the memory location here to that byte here. It's very simple format and it just keeps looping around until we're done. When we're done, we reset the count here. Now, when we want to set the bytes on the screen, I just think we need to look at set tile to see that. Well, the first thing we have to do is work out the location. We do that here. And then what we're doing is we're actually um, checking if the VDP can take any more commands. If it's full, then we wait for the frame. If it's not, then we actually set the counter to zero so that the queue will not half process while we're adding another command because that would end up with some confusion potentially. So we set the, set the queue to zero and then the next part of the processing happens in simple tile here. If I just search for this. And here it is, very simple. So what we do is we save A, which contains the tile number, to the VDP buffer, increase Y, and then save Y back to the counter here. And so that means the queue is now in the correct position again for when the interrupt occurs. So there we go, very straightforward. Now we've also changed the Super Nintendo version, and the Super Nintendo version is basically now the same as the original NES version. We're saving to a buffer, and the buffer is in the same format as the screen memory. So here is the code that is doing all the work in the non-maskable interrupt. So we're just backing up our registers here. We're setting the memory position to zero because that's where the tile map is in VDP memory. We then have to tell the VDP what order we're writing the bytes to so that the bytes go into the memory in the correct order. And that's that command here. 
These are all relating to the non-maskable interrupt procedure. This is telling it that we want to write to two consecutive bytes because we have to write in byte pairs to the VDP memory and they use two registers. This is the register address. It's 2118 if I remember correctly, but we only have to write the low byte of it. Then we're loading in the memory address of the screen buffer. Notice we're doing it in 24-bit addresses here. That's why there's three of them. And this is the size of the amount of memory we want to copy, 24-bit again. And then here we're just starting up the command. I can't actually remember what this command does. It, it does do something, but I've forgotten. So you'll just have to bear with me on that. It's the lack of code commenting there for you. So there we go. So this is how we get the Super Nintendo hardware to do a DMA memory copy, and that's the fastest kind of copy there is. So that is good enough to get all of the VDP memory updated in one frame. Now when it comes to doing the short tiles on the Atari Lynx, we're having to do our calculations based on sixes instead of eights. Now when, when you want to calculate a multiple of eight, what you can, can do is just keep doing rotations. So rotate left to double things. When, you, when you're doing a multiple of six, that's not as easy. So what I'm doing is I'm Rotate, if you think of the value 1 and you want to multiply 1 by 6, you could add 1 6 times, but what you can also do is double it, save that, double it again, and then add those two values together. So you're actually effectively adding the value times 4 and the value times 2, and then you get the value times 6. And I think that's the faster way of doing things, so that's what I've been doing here. So we're doing a shift here, saving it, another shift and saving it, so that's getting the value times 4 and that's getting the value times two, and then the resulting value stored in Y is the value times six. And then when it comes to actually skipping some of the bytes, we've got a command here, and you can see all we're doing is we're comparing and seeing if we've, we're on the first line or the fifth line, and I'm skipping two of the lines at sort of third positions because they, ten they tend to be the neatest ones. You need the middle to be intact and the top and the bottom line to be intact to get the shapes roughly correct. So, and then the skipping line command just does four ink HLs because that's what we need to do here. Now, obviously this isn't very efficient, but the thing you've got to remember is the Atari Lynx is actually one of the faster processors and the smaller screens. So it's got, it's got speed to spare, so I'm not being particularly efficient here. Anyway, though, you can see that that is giving the effect of skipping two of the lines. And for a quick project like this, this is, gives me the benefit of not having to redraw all of my sprites, which is a good thing. So there we go. So as I said before, I've got a few little things left to do on the last day. So I'm going to try and the multicolor VIC-20 mode. I'm going to fix the randomizer. I fix the web address. Don't think that's going to take very long. Comment the code, fix the BBC graphics. And so hopefully we'll have a finished game tomorrow. Anyway, that's enough for today's episode. I hope you're enjoying the series. Remember, we've got Grime 68000 coming after this series, so please stick around for that. Anyway, thanks for watching today, and goodbye.